What's up you all? Welcome back to Dallas, Texas. Tonight's agenda, play in a private game here in Dallas. It's a 5-5, but it's not for the faint of heart. It's a 5K buy-in. At least that's what I'm coming in for. And I want to show you guys what the private game scene is like here in Dallas, Texas. The last time I played at this place, I made a video. I played like an 8K pot against our buddy Daryl. And uh, that video got over 110,000 views. So I wanted to run it back and uh, see what shenanigans we could get into tonight. If you guys like these private games, let me know down below. It's a super cool environment. They got like a private chef, you got massages, you got all the TVs and sports you could want mixed with like a bunch of like candy and it's just an awesome environment. If any of you guys are in Dallas and want to play in it, hit me up on Instagram, I guess. I could probably get you into it. But as for now, 5-5 five, five in for 5K. Let's see the hands we are going to play. Let's go. Jumping right into the video, we are playing $5,000 deep in a 5-5 five, five game. So what is that? A thousand big blinds here in Dallas, Texas. The games are ginormous. We're going to start off with a raise to 25, get 3-bet, and we see a call from Daryl. I'm putting in the call as well. Might also want to 4-bet from time to time, playing a little bit more conservatively in this first hand. And we're off to a flop, which comes 9-5 deuce with 2 spades. Action checks through on the flop. Surprisingly, the uh, hijack did not want to bet into two opponents. He probably has a hand like ace-king, ace-queen. Maybe he has a hand like sixes or sevens that just want to check behind. Either way, the turn is a welcome sight. It comes the queen of diamonds, giving me top pair. And Daryl now takes the opportunity to bet out into the field for $140. It's a chunky size bet, and uh, I could occasionally be raising... Uh, he might be doing this with jack-10. He also could be doing this with ace-5, ace-3 of spades. Having the king of spades in my hand is kind of relevant, but uh, more times than not, I'm just going to put in the call. That's what I decided to do, and the hijack gets out of the way. Good news for us that he didn't call there with a hand like ace-queen and have us smoked. When the river comes aboard, pairing five of hearts makes it a little bit less likely. Daryl has pocket five, so now his value is going to be all the queen-x. He could have pocket deuces and pocket nines. All of his bluffs are going to be like jack-10, miss spades, and then maybe a random ace-king that tried to get me to fold one time. So when he bets out for $200, it's not exactly the best situation to be in. Uh, I think a lot of his bluffs are going to go for this sizing, but also a lot of his value as well. Still with top pair and second best kicker, I decide to put in the call for $200. Daryl shows us the bad news. It was a hand I did not suspect. We caught up on the turn. We didn't want to see the queen, and he's taking down that $900 pot straight out of the gate. Nice hand, Daryl. All right, hand number two. Our stack has diminished down $700, but no fear. 8-7 of clubs is here, and I raise it up to 20 bucks. Button three bets me to $100. He goes by Elijah, sometimes on some live streams out here. He goes by the GTO Lizard. A fun opponent, definitely on the more aggressive side, but definitely balanced. I'm going to put in the call here. Out of position, I could be 4-betting if I wanted to represent the top top of my range. But all in all, going to defend here with a suited connector. And we're off to a flop, which gives me a pair. Backdoor straight ideas and backdoor flush ideas as well. I start with a check. Now, Elijah is a good player, but like I said, a little bit aggressive, so I would expect him to continue more often than not with his king-queen suited, his ace-king suited, ace-ten suited. A lot of hands that have a lot of equity versus my one pair, but I uh, still might want to go for a bet and try to get me to fold a better hand. $60 is the price that he wants to set, and I could put in the call. I think more often than not, that's probably the best play, but against an aggressive opponent like Elijah, I really just want to deny him equity with all of his overcards, so I decided to go for a check raise to $225. I would expect this check raise to shut that hand down uh, more often than not in this spot, so when he puts in the call, some alarm bells are going off. Does he have a hand like pocket nines? Does he have tens through aces? Those are all possibilities. He also still could have a hand like 10 jack suited, uh, maybe queen jack suited for a gutter and a flush draw. A lot of stuff like that. So all in all, not the worst situation when he puts in the call. And it gets even better for us on the turn when we bank two pair. Bang! The seven of diamonds peels off. Now I'm really hoping to the poker gods that they gave him pocket tens through pocket aces. What a dream spot that would be. I'm going to go chunky here. I'd be doing this with all of my draws as well. Uh, although 5-6 and 10-jack have a straight. So I'm not exactly sure what draws I would have check raised on the flop that don't get there on the turn. That's neither here nor there. I go for $550 targeting all the over pairs that wanted to continue. Maybe a hand like Queen Jack of Diamonds could continue once more. $550 is the price that I lay. Elijah folds. I turn over the seven of clubs. 
indicating to him that it's a possibility I had my favorite hand pocket sevens and uh, he's gonna have to watch this vlog to see what I had. All right, we upgrade all the way up to the Cowboys, only fitting that we are in Texas. I come in for a raise to $40 over a $10 straddle, and we see Nemo on the button comes in for the three bet, a small sizing here of around 2.5X. Actually, I kinda like it. He goes for 100 bucks, actions back over to me. Obviously, I'm gonna four bet, being I'm out of position. I don't wanna just call here, give him a good price to catch up on the flop turn or river. So I'm gonna go for a four bet. It doesn't need to be too large. I am gonna be out of position and I decide to go for $240. The reason why I say the four bet doesn't need to be too large is because four bets are super, super strong. You just don't see people doing it that often with five, six suited or maybe a hand like pocket eights or pocket nines. It's always usually hands like ace, king, king, queen, pocket kings, all of that good stuff. So you don't really need to go too large because you're already screaming a lot of strength. Nemo does not decide to put in the five bet. He puts in the call, and that leads us off to a flop, which comes Jin for us. King, 10, 9, bang, we flop top set. The only hand we're really worried about at this point is queen, jack, suited. Still, I'm not gonna slow down on this great board for me. I bet out for $175. If he has queen, jack, suited, so be it. He's probably gonna put in a raise or just call. We still could boat up on the turn or river, but that's not what happens. Nemo decides... He thinks something's fishy in this hand and folds his cards. So unfortunately for us, we cannot get any extra value in this one, but still pretty cool to flop top set. Doesn't happen too often. We worked our way back almost to even 4,900 in our stack. I'm gonna put in the call here with A7 suited. Two other people put in the call as well. That means we are going five ways to the flop. A little side note, why did I decide not to three bet a good suited ace? Well, sometimes in these spots where you know you're gonna go multi-way, it's okay to call with hands that can draw to the nuts. A7 suited obviously can hit the nut flush and cooler a lot of other opponents. So rather than three bet to $100 and give other opponents the opportunity to fold with three, four of diamonds or seven, eight of diamonds, I decided to put in the call here and go five ways. And obviously it comes good for us when it comes king nine, four with two diamonds. Scott decides to check from under the gun and Daryl takes the betting lead and fires out for $60. Raising here seems a little bit too much. I wanna just call and let other diamond draws call as well. Scott puts in the call and one other player does as well. So we've only eliminated one player, four ways to the turn, and does it come gin for us? Absolutely, the deuce of diamonds. Bang, we turn the nut flush. When the action's on Daryl once again, he checks it over to me and now we're in an interesting spot. I think if the only other player behind me had a flush, he would obviously bet this turn. So I decided to do something tricky and check it over to him. Also, when Daryl bets the flop and checks the turn, he's obviously scared of the diamonds. So he probably has a hand like king 10, king 9, maybe king queen, stuff like that. I don't really know what Scott has. He could also have a flush. But uh, checking behind here, I don't think loses too much value. We still could get paid off by Daryl on the river. He won't think that I checked behind on the turn with a flush. Scott might have made a flush on the turn and then just bets the river and I can raise him and he can't fold. And also, it might not even get to the river that cheaply if the player behind me decides to bet himself. Uh, in this spot, though, that's not what he decides to do. It checks behind on the turn, bringing in a board pairing four of clubs. Interesting card once again, and when Scott checks for a third time, I don't think he's going to have a flush in the spot. Daryl checks it once again. He still could have a decent king or maybe a two-pair type of hand. Now I definitely need to go for value, and I want to make it look like a bluff. I'm not going to be checking the turn behind too often. It's just a weird circumstance where I decided to do it. So I decided to polarize and fire out for $350. The player behind me folds. Scott puts in the call. Look at that. Daryl gets out of the way and a thousand dollar pot is getting shipped over to me when I turn over the nut flush. The board is paired, so I didn't have the effective nuts on the board, but uh, pretty sure that I was taking this one down. $1,100 coming my way and it looks like that turn check got me what potentially could be the maximum in this hand. Let's freaking go. All right, our stack has finally crossed the threshold of being in Profitsville. I feel like I just took that out of a Brad Owen video. Don't sue me, Brad, I love you, man. <laughs> Max raises it up to $15 from under the gun. Daryl on my right puts in the call from the cutoff, and obviously I'm coming in for a three bet with an ace-queen offsuit, a beautiful hand, and I make it $60. Under the gun ranges are very strong and Max knows this and decides to 4-bet to $180, kind of a large sizing. 
3x. I guess he's out of position, so I don't hate it there. When the action folds back around to me, I'm not going to be 5 betting. I'm not going to be folding. Ace Queen off is too good to fold. I put in the call, and we flop ourselves top pair on a very dry board Queen 7 4 Rainbow. At this point, we're either way ahead or way behind. Hands that we would be way behind are obviously Aces and Kings. He still could have the last remaining combination of pocket Queens. And uh, aside from that, I think those are the only hands we're losing to. Hands that we're beating here are all of the uh, random Broadway cards that he would have 4-bet with. And then uh, maybe some suited connectors like 5-6 suited or maybe 8-9 suited as well. When he bets out for $150, nothing for me to do other than call. Not going to raise here and get rid of all of his bluffs and only get snap called by his nutted hands. So I put in the 150 and we see a turn card which really shouldn't change too much coming the 8 of diamonds. Now when he polarizes and size up to nearly pot for $500, alarm bells are going off in my head. He's still representing strong hands like aces and kings. Like I said, one combination of queens. Can't really uh, expect him to have that too often. Still, when you make top pair in a 4-bet pot, I'm looking for reasons to put the money in, not reasons to fold. I can't play scared. Got to put in a stack of $500 and proceed to the river. His uh, river action is going to be very telling. So when the 3 of spades peels off in a $1,600 pot and he checks, I mean, now seems like a decent time to go for a bet. But hold on, before I just randomly fire out for $800 here, what am I targeting? At a very, very small frequency, I think Max would check aces and kings on this river. I am going to have some pocket queens in my range, so he might just want to pot control and allow me to do the betting on the river. Uh, he's also going to be giving up with ace king and ace jack suited and all of that stuff. Another decent option is to go for a small bet here on the river and target hands like jacks or tens. I think a $500 bet would accomplish that. However, if I go small, it also opens the door for him to go for a check raise with a hand like queens or maybe a hand like pocket sevens if he somehow has that in this spot. So all in all, I know I played this super passively. You can let me know down below if I should have gone for a thin bet here. But I really didn't want to get check raised on the river, although I don't think it's going to happen too frequently. I decided to check behind. He turns over a worse hand. Ace three of diamonds. He almost got there on the river. A diamond would have been a catastrophe, but you know what's not a catastrophe? Taking down a $1,700 pot. I'm not going to get too greedy. And ace three of diamonds might have been a hand that he would have turned into a bluff. Imagine I bet 500 on the river and he just rips it in my face. That would have been pretty gross. And obviously I think I would have folded. So taking on this pot, can't complain about that. Let's tip out the dealer and move right into the next hand. King queen offsuit from the low jack. I raise it up to 20. Max has some evil intentions. He wants to get some of his chips back and uh, makes it $70 to go. When the action folds around to me, I put in the call and we see another great flop, which comes king seven deuce. This one a little bit more wet than the last hand. Still not going to be donking into the pre-flop three better, so I check it over to Max, who checks behind from the cutoff. The ace of clubs is much better for his three betting range than my calling range, so I check it over to him once again. Surprisingly, he doesn't use this card to fire out. He checks behind, bringing in the river, which comes the queen of spades. I played it super passively up until this point. I now have two pair and I want to get value against hands such as Queen Jack, maybe a hand like King 10 that didn't want to bet on the flop or turn. So I bet out for $100 on the river into the $150 pot. Will Max put in the call? I think it's unlikely given the line up until this point and sure enough, he does muck his cards. Still chipping up, taking down another pot, 2-0 against Max. No complaints in that regard. Pocket Nueves is the next hand here, this time from the big blind. Hijack raises up to 20, that is Nemo. Daryl puts in the flat call from the small blind, and I decide to come in as well. Three amigos off to a flop, and are we going to flop ourselves Jin? No, it comes 10-10-4 with two diamonds, and Daryl starts with a check. Kind of a fun spot, I think you could have a leading range on this board. You gotta think who is more likely to have a 10 in this spot. I think the people in the blinds are more likely to have that. Also, Nemo is going to have a lot of overcards, so uh, betting with pocket nines can't be a bad play, denying equity towards Nemo. And if he wants to call with a hand like King Queen suited and just brick off on the turn, so be it. We'll make a little bit of extra cheddar. However, I check it over to Nemo. He checks behind, and we turn ourselves the boat. The nine of hearts. Bang! We turn a boat. 
Daryl checks it once again, and now I have to get value. I size up to $50. I'm just trying to get as much money in as possible without being suspicious, of course. Nemo puts in the call, so could he have a hand like ace-10 and he got tricky on the flop? I'm really hoping. And uh, could he have a hand also like queen-jack for an open-ended straight draw? Could also have some diamonds like ace-5, ace-3 of diamonds, although I would expect those to bet the flop a large portion of the time. Still, I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty too much here. We have a boat. I went for value. Nemo called. And the river comes. The queen of hearts bringing in backdoor heart draw and also a hand like king-jack if he had that as well. 160 in the middle, and if he has any really good hands, I want to go for maximum value. So I overbet the pot for a substantial amount, $250 into the $160 pot. Why am I polarizing so large? Well, he's going to have a hard time folding a hand like ace-10, obviously. He's probably just going to raise me with a hand like pocket fours if he even has that. King-jack is a straight. He's not going to fold for any price. And uh, yeah, just got to go large, get maximum value, and he snap calls. He just absolutely snap calls me. Pot is ballooned up to $660. I turn over my boat, and Nemo shows pocket aces. Checking behind on the flop allowed me to catch up. I wasn't going to fold the one bet anyways, so uh, probably the pot is about as small as it was going to get. He might have lost the minimum in that one. Pocket aces, though, down in flames. It's a hard hand to play, and he showed it in this one. 660 coming over to me. Ship it over to Wolfgang. Let's go. Pocket nines are pretty sweet, but you know what's even better? Pocket sevens, my favorite hand. I'm in the small blind and pop it up to $30. Getting two callers is pretty nice, and we see an interesting board on a jack six six rainbow. I decided to start with a check. I'm not going to have many sixes in my small blind three betting range, and I think a lot of opponents could have a jack and do the betting for me. I also don't want to bet here and then get raised and be in a weird spot. So when I check, both others do as well. And of course, we turn ourselves another boat, the seven of spades. Bang, we turn ourselves the second boat in two hands. What is life? Going to check it over once again, get a little trappy and try to go for a check raise. Villain in middle position takes the bait like a fish on the hook. He fires out for $35. Action's back over to me. And I didn't check here on the turn to not go for a check raise. Let's represent ace jack. Let's represent pocket sevens. Let's also represent a hand like eight nine suited for a bluff. Maybe ace five of spades as well. I make it $105 to go. Middle position folds, and uh, yeah, we're taking down 130 in that pot. Big blind once again, this time with the best hand ever created, other than my favorite hand, pocket sevens. This one is American Airlines, and I find myself in the big blind, and I come in for a $200 three bet over Danny on the button, who makes it $50. There was a limper for 10 bucks, the straddle was on, and the limper decides to turn himself and evolve like a Pokemon into a limp jammer. He just jams it all in for 275. If it's good for 10, it's good for 275, I guess. Danny gets out of the way. I put in the snap call with the best hand ever created. And we're off to a flop, and he turns over pocket sixes. The flop comes king, queen, six. Oh, no. How did he just catch up there? 80-20 dog, and he just immediately hits it on the flop. The turn gives me a lot of life, though. I have outs to any jack. And of course, any spade would give me a flush. The river, though, is a brick. The three of diamonds, 615 shipped over to the limp jammer. And our stack is taking a small hit, moving us right along into the last hand of the night and arguably one of the most interesting hands I played on the session. Go figure, it's against Elijah, aka the GTO Lizard once again. He puts in the straddle to 10 bucks. I look down at the ladies here in Dallas, Texas. I make it 40 to go and he calls out of the straddle. We flop ourselves an overpair on a jack 7 5 board with two spades, and Elijah checks it over to me. Now, quickly thinking about who has the range advantage on this board, I think it goes to Elijah. When he just calls out of the straddle, he's going to be doing that with hands like jack 10 offsuit. He's also going to have like 7 5 suited. He also could have pocket 7s and pocket 5s. My raising range is mostly going to be consisted around the jack. So I'm going to have ace jack, king jack, pocket jacks. And then, of course, because my favorite hand is pocket 7s, I'm going to have all of those as well. But he's going to have more of the 6-8 and the 6-4 and the spade draws and all of that good stuff. So I decided to check it behind on this board, bringing in the three of hearts on the turn. 6-4 now has made a straight, and Elijah is definitely more likely to have that than myself. I probably don't even think I have any 6-4 suited in my range from the low jack. So when he bets out for $50, it's an interesting spot. He's going to have that as value. He's also going to have all of the sets that have me beat. However, he's also going to have hands like Jack-10 and King-Jack. When I check behind on the flop, I have severely underplayed my hand. 
That being said, there is a front door spade draw and a back door heart draw that are out there. So I want to raise this up and charge him the maximum. I make it $155 to go. When the action's back over to Elijah, he seems a little perplexed by this, but ultimately decides to come in for another raise. He three bets me on the turn to $400, and this is a line that I don't experience too often. He is a good player, very aggressive, like I said earlier, so this fits the MO. I don't think he's going to be doing this with any of his jacks anymore. So what this screams like to me is either a spade draw, a heart draw, 6-4 being a straight or any of the sets like 7s or 5s. Given the fact that I have underrepped my hand on the flop, I'm going to put in the call here but proceed with caution on the river as now when I put in the call in a 3-bet pot on the turn, I've kind of exposed the strength of my hand, being that I have a decent one. So if he goes for a bet on the river, my hand almost is a bluff catcher at that point. I put in the call for 245 more dollars, and we see a king of diamonds on the river. Now, what does this bring in? Well, all of his king high flush draws being spade and heart now have made it top pair and would want to continue betting. His sets also probably would feel comfortable continue betting given the fact that both heart draws and spade draws have bricked off. So when he bets out for $650 into the $890 pot, there are just a lot of good hands he could have in his range at this point. Also, given the fact that I called his turn 3 bet, he kind of knows that I have a strong hand, so I would expect him to shut down on the river with a lot of his bluffs. All that summarized into a sentence means that uh, I'm giving him a lot of credit for having a strong hand here. Sets two pairs, he also could have a straight being 6-4, and then all of his flush draws that now made top pair would want to continue betting, targeting a hand like ace-jack suited that I would check behind on the flop. $650 is a lot of real US currency. I decide to fold it, and we will never know what he has because he folds face down. You guys can let me know down in the comments. Did I make a good fold here the last hand of the night? Was I a little bit nitty folding pocket queens? Did he just get there with a king on the river? Did he have a set, a straight? Did he have a miss spade bluff, given the fact I don't have any spades in my hand to block that? Let me know down in the comments. That's going to wrap up this session here at the private game, a.k.a. the domain game. Let's bring it to the outro. All right, that wraps up the session at the domain game here in Dallas. Got in for 5000 out for $54.80, so a profit of 480 bucks. Could have been a little bit more if I uh, called there maybe against Elijah and I was right, but uh, who knows if that was a good fold or not. As for now, we are signing off another fun home game experience, home game, private game, whatever you want to call it in Dallas. If you guys want to invite to this game or any other ones in Dallas, let me know in the comments, Instagram. There's a few links down below to some training courses and online poker if you want to check that out. But as for now, I'm off to the next adventure. I'll catch you in the next video. As always, you guys, hope you run about as good as I did tonight, and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.